They're walking away ain't quite so easy this time. If your first movie is good enough, people want another one, then you make another one. And Olympus has fallen, kind of took everybody by surprise. So we immediately got pressure to uh, make a sequel. But I thought, where do you go? Like, you've attacked the White House. You've taken the president hostage. You've started at the very top. And I really wasn't sure where we could take it. So that was the big challenge. To me, big action means real action. And that's what turns me on, is the fact that we do it in a way that is believable. And so it's very affecting for the audience. And, and that's, it's good to play as an actor, and it's good to see as an audience member. Mike, come on! Mike's not a superhero. He's a regular human being, but he's brilliant at what he does. He's incredibly tough, and he's brutal. And that's one of the things I love about Mike. He's kind of unforgettable because he's punishing. We can do this through really fucking hard. <laughs> he's kind of an anti-hero sometimes when you look at him like that. He's, he's definitely not the most perfect. He pushes too hard sometimes. That's the sound of your brother dying. But he's the guy you want on his side. Kind of reminds me a little bit of your, like Leonidas in 300, where they're the heroes, but they do stuff that's pretty questionable. Was that really necessary? No. Jerry Butler brings vulnerability and fearfulness and some uh, humanity into a character who's basically a war machine. He's very engaging and tough. He's a real tough guy. And that's what a film like this really thrives on, calls for. And he's also a producer on this one. He's very good at wearing the producer hat and the actor hat and seamlessly going between the two. So I just found that just very impressive. But the good thing about Jerry is I have never seen anybody work as hard as he works. I mean, not only on his own role, and that's why he's become a producer, but he really, really looks at each role, not just his, he looks at the entire scope of the movie and each scene and how each scene plays. He would make an amazing director. I do think you should see him run it. And it's not like they do. They just had to close the door because that. Yes, he was the actor, but also he was the producer, which meant to me, like, you know, sometimes if I needed anything, you know, for the production, I could directly ask him. And he was always keen on, like, you know, backing me up. So it wasn't like, you know, go back to the producers and try to convince them, you know, need this and that. But because also he was with me on set every day, you know, so he, he could see what we went through in order to get what we needed. So that was a good thing. But it's like, you know, just a beat before that, like, you know, you're, you're still in that conversation that just happened. <coughs> And then you look out, and then fuck, you know, there is a transition from your first reaction to the second one, basically, you see. Well, it was just interesting to get another artist's take on where the franchise could go. And, and Babak comes very much a man of his soul. Everything has to be kind of streamed through his consciousness and where has he had any previous experience of this? How can we make it meaningful and truthful to an audience? So I think he brought a lot of uh, sensitivity to the movie. And uh, he didn't have a massive amount of experience in action movies, but we brought all the team and he knew where to say, okay, you guys do this. And he brought his expertise and it was really a great kind of union. I think Bob Beck's just a wonderful guy. He knows what he wants and he kind of attacks it. I think that he's got a different vision for this film than the first one in terms of his approach. When I read the script, I felt like a kid in a candy shop. You know, that old 12-year-old boy within you that, you know, start thinking about, you know, how to do this movie. How would I blow up a bridge, you know, or crash in a helicopter in the middle of a high park? That's a lot of fun. Along with all the explosion and the mayhem and the craziness with Babak, I think he will never lose sight of, you know, the humanity of the individuals. I never thought you would outlive me. And I've had an absolutely wonderful time with Babak. <laughs> Everybody was more than happy to come back because the first one turned out great and then performed really well. So they all wanted to jump back on that bandwagon, you know? 
unhand me. Never. What an amazing cast for the first film, and to have these guys back again. Um, it's a great team of people. Wonder if Stefan can know his mistake? Sure. Take a look at this. If someone had asked me, name some actors that would be a dream to work with. Uh, Robert Forster, Jackie Earl Haley, Melissa Leo, and Morgan Freeman would be people on that list. Morgan Freeman probably being, you know, number one. And so now I'm in the room with all of them, which is a little intimidating. I was quite happy with the cast. You, know, you get good actors, it's, there were no surprises. <laughs> The crazy thing about London is such a wonderful city. It's full of adventure, it's an iconic city, great architecture, and yet not many action movies are made there. So it felt like the field was open for us to make something that's going to be provocative in a way that you go, oh, I don't see this so much, because it's kind of uneasy when this attack unfolds. So once we started feeling the impact of how that would unfold, we kind of thought, this could be awesome. Well, the only question is if you if you shoot it which I think is good coverage is from behind the fence with people running away. I think when I met Babak, we sort of both agreed pretty instantaneously. We kind of wanted something that was a little bit more European in its sensibilities, in terms of the image, just a little bit pushed down. More like an old Fuji film stock or something. We liked the greeniness, and we really wanted London to be seen in a sort of interesting and textured way. And we also wanted to sort of try and move slightly away from a very heavy, cutty, sort of action film. So we've tried to use slightly longer shots and more considered shots to get in the action. Obviously, there's still lots going on all the time. Just trying to make sure that it's a little bit more smoothness in it, a little bit more connectivity. many challenges to a big action film like this. Some of them are geographical, some of them are creative, and some of them are economic. You need a lot of doubles. There's quite often two units shooting at the same time, multiple stuntmen. Um, so it's just kind of quite a logistical thing as well, figuring out all the numbers, how many you need, getting them broken down making sure there's enough trousers. If the actor accidentally rips a pair on set, you need a pair immediately there to replace them. So it is quite a logistical thing. I am in Washington when this is all going on, so I was not there for, and nor will I be there for all the shooting and uh, stuff they have to shoot in Bulgaria and other places. Don't know why, but St. Paul's wouldn't let us blow up their front steps. Uh. <laughs> to shoot in center of London is nearly impossible. First of all, you have to get permit, and which takes forever, and then they don't let you do certain kind of action, and you have to work in certain kind of days. Ah! And it's an expensive, let's face it, very expensive to shoot in London. So what we did, we did a combination. We shot partly in London, and partly we built here in New Boyana Studios. But the studio can be in any other place, except I feel very comfortable and I like Bulgaria. We quickly realized that what we would have to do is literally build London in the back lot of the studio. And we decided we're going to build the entire facade and the statue in front of St. Paul's one-to-one -one scale. We found the area in the studio, we cleared it out, and sure enough, it's standing there now, one-to-one -one, uh, in scale. You have the whole St. Paul's in front of you, and then you turn around and you see the Bulgarian mountains in the background, which is also amazing. 
And then we knew we needed to use Mayfair streets. And again, you can't flip cars and have shootouts in the real Mayfair street. So we built Mayfair street and we built East End of London, and we built various alleys and alcoves and other streets, and the result is fantastic. I've never really been in a place where they could achieve this kind of detail, this scale, and yet still not, you know, break the banks, so to speak. It's all cork. Soft materials, part of these columns, this side and this side will blow out, but they're foam, they're soft material, as are the bullet hits as well. So there's nothing hard in any of them. You have a lot of freedom. You can do basically whatever you want. It's just like, you know, I want to blow up this car and I want it to flip up in there and landing on the vehicle over there, you know, sure, you know, and then arrange it for you. Scenes are more big explosions and they're great fun. But I think St. Paul's has a real visceral feel to it. I was very pleased with the St. Paul's scene because there are about 300 extras, 100 stunts, all dressed as various police, dignitaries, etc. And I was very pleased with the way the scene turned out and how all the action worked. The fact that, you know, again, you're offered a playground where you have all the toys you need. Which brings me back to being the kid in the candy shop. You know? <laughs> There's nothing better than sitting in a cinema being excited, being scared, or being entertained. You know, with your adrenaline going, think, I don't know what's going to happen next. Box command, <laughs> we found them. <clears throat> the president's alive. Yeah. Yeah. And also to buy into the notion of heroism, to be inspired, to see people who are willing to lay down their lives for their country, you know, good against evil. I love those kind of stories, and I think audiences do too, which is why these movies do so well. Yeah.